Welcome in to BDGE's first ever inaugural Dynasty Fantasy Football video. If you are here on the main channel, we have now launched a Dynasty only channel, which these videos you'll see for about a month, and then we will cut it off. Cold Turkey, everything Dynasty will be going on the Dynasty only channel. That will be the first link in the description. Make sure you are subscribed there if you are playing in Dynasty. If you're not yet in Dynasty, head into the Discord. We will hook you up. We will get you into a BDGE Dynasty League. As you can see next to me, Hi. we have two very handsome young men. Please introduce yourselves. These will be my co-hosts multiple times throughout the weeks, as well as putting up individual videos on the Dynasty channel going forward. Adam, take it away. Hi, uh, <laughs> Adam South Harmon, Fantasy Football, now the leader of the BDGE Dynasty team. Settle this down. is our you know, co-host right here. Hank, the youngest of the group. Uh, this is Andrew over at uh, the League FFB, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, man, here at BDGE, ready to get it in. Yeah, if you're unfamiliar with these two, you're going to love their work. They bring it. They bring the energy. They bring the research. They certainly bring the yapping. So if Whole you like what you hear from them, uh, make sure you subscribe to both of their channels. Today, what we're going to do is predict the first two rounds of a Dynasty startup draft. We did this on the Redraft channel, and y'all loved it. So I figured, why not just transfer that energy over to some Dynasty sheesh? So we're going to go basically through the ADP that Adam has on his website right now, which has 144 startup drafts already in the books, and it does include rookie picks as well. This is super flex, and we're just going to talk about things that we see, things that we don't see, that we would like to see in this ADP in terms of where we think drafts are going to look like for y'all when, let's say, a month after the NFL draft happens. <laughs> Now is the time to yap. Come on, yapper. Go ahead. You yeah. start us off, man. What you hear, the word, you hear the word yap? That's basically the same thing as me saying Andy. It was, it was cute. Yeah. It was your cue. I'm the Yaposaurus Rex. So <laughs> what the first thing that really stands out to me, and, and keep in mind, we've been monitoring this over the last week or two, mm -hmm. and we've already seen a lot of changes. I was going to say, I did hella notes, like the same thing that you <laughs> like, did. I had mine, and I was like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. A week later, I'm like, I had already cracked Irrelevant. Myself. Doesn't Unreal. matter. So I think one thing that we've already noticed is that Chris McCaffrey is already falling down draft boards. That's one thing Nick, you and I said at the beginning that we didn't expect that to remain the same mm -hmm. going into June or later into the offseason. My first thing that I want to ask is, do you think that this is something that is still going to continue trending down? Do you think Chris McCaffrey is still going to fall down draft boards? Do you think, because he's sitting right now at the 204. Yes. I mean, I just think that an aging running back when – I think at moving forward, running backs in Dynasty or in redraft should be similar. Like, we should be valuing them more on a one-year basis than really super long-term at that position anyway. But this cycle from right now here when you're watching this in February all the way till the draft comes around, it, the, the aging guys like Christian McCaffrey are just going to trend down the board, I think, they keep further falling. and further. And he was yes. like, when we first looked at the data, he was the 112. And right. I was like, there ain't no one – in their right mind, using a first-round pick on, on him. And listen, he's, what, 28 right now? He'll be 29 by the start of next season. You don't want to draft a dude that old in the first round of a startup draft. If you're new to Dynasty, that's a mistake that you'll probably make because the names are so flashy. Now we drop to 204. I do, I do wonder, though, like a lot of the times when I'm in startup drafts, sometimes my first few picks, like I, I won't go in with a strategy, but my first pick might dictate my second pick. For instance, like if I go... You see at the 111 where it's a rookie pick. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm building youth. C-Mac might not make sense. But if you build, if you take like a veteran with the 107 or something, you might be more likely to go straight into win now mode and make C-Mac that pick there. I do think though, like the generation coming into Dynasty Fantasy, like a lot of dudes from our redraft channel will end up being the people that segue themselves over to Dynasty stuff. will understand from us and, and be the ones that kind of push towards the youth that I would be surprised if, Brees Hall doesn't jump C-Mac. I would be surprised if Trevor Lawrence doesn't jump C-Mac. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I could see him being pushed further I, and further down the board. I even think there's going to be a point where Gibbs probably gets in the range or maybe ahead of uh, McCaffrey, agree. too. And I think to the point – right now we're watching football still, right? Like, you're seeing S San Francisco still alive. So yeah. people are still watching him kind of, like, get off, right? And as that becomes more of the youth guys coming in and people are focusing on young guys – to the point you're making, though, about staying fluid, I think earlier in the startup, for me, typically when I draft, I like to stay 
I don't like to b- basically make myself rigid by going down and picking CMC early because right. now I feel like I don't want to have CMC and then have a productive struggle type team. It's going to make that pick almost sunk sunk cost even worse. So I try to stay more fluid early, and then if it comes to me in, later in the draft that I take older age, I will. But I think he'll probably fall. I think, honestly, one thing that I'll be shocked if it doesn't move forward – like that 301 pick three, the 103, I, I don't think there's any way that's not a second-round pick. Yeah, uh, because the rookie class is so quarterback heavy, and yes. those end up being um, – I think back to like last year, like A. Rich, I think in startup drafts, was going around – honestly, he, around where he is right now, 112, yep. 201, right? That's where he was taken. Yep. And I think like Bijan was right in that zone. Uh, Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud didn't fall much further than the end of the second round. I think most people will probably look at the prospects – Relative to, like, what they are now to what we looked at as C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young last year, which I don't think anyone was, like, over the moon about those guys for the most part. Right. But people are going to be in love with Caleb Williams. They're going to be in love with Drake May. They're going to be in love with Jaden Daniels because of his rushing ability. Well, and that that's the biggest thing, too, is, like, so you had C.J., you had Bryce, and you had A. Rich last year. Right now, you're looking at with this draft class and the way it's going to shake out, all the mocks right now are projecting basically the first three, four picks are going to be quarterback, 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 wide receiver. Well, dude, I like uh, – there's a bunch of mock drafts that I see now on Twitter where it's like the first six or seven picks are basically all, fan- all fantasy-relevant players. Right, and, and because you're going to have super flex quarterbacks, yeah. guys. Yeah, Andrew, fuck go. it. Cut it. Well, I was going to say because you <laughs> think of like some of these rookies and like we like you said, you've already been looking at some of these mock drafts and some of these landing spots, and we're trying to project where this is going to be – once it's June and, and these guys have already landed on teams, imagine imagine a Jaden Daniels that lands in a situation like Atlanta where he has B. John Robinson, Drake London, Kyle Pitts. He can use his rushing upside. Like just how you're speaking about that 3-1. Right. If Jaden Daniels is in Atlanta, I, I could see him getting higher than Kyler. I could even see him potentially just off of the hype and the buzz getting higher than like a quarterback like Jordan Love that we're seeing at the 208. Well, t- tell, me, tell me realistically, like what is the difference between Anthony Richardson – in uh, Jaden Daniels with top 10 draft capital. It's the same thing, right? You're making the same bet for the most part. And, and right now you're seeing him at the 112. Exactly. And he's coming off of a season where he got hurt but showed some flash. Exactly. Jaden Daniels is going to go up there. I'd feel more comfortable with A. Rich, I think, based off what I saw for sure. I do I'm too. not saying I wouldn't take Jay. You, I agree with you 100%. I just mean that I think he shouldn't be far behind. He shouldn't be that far behind. I, I think I agree. I was actually going to bring up some of these QBs because, again, this is super flex, and that's such a big part of, like, the startup strategy here. Mm -hmm. There's a few guys I see. A. Rich, I wouldn't be surprised if he jumps up to right behind Burrow there. I agree with you. With Dynasty people, the way that they play is, like, you only need one guy to draft a player that they think has that ceiling, right? Like, Mm -hmm. one guy in your league needs to believe that A. Rich will be the 101 of startup drafts next year for him to take him at – the 108, and that usually ends up being like any player that has upside will be taken at their upside because it only takes one out of 12 people in your league to do it. So I see A. Rich jumping up. Yep. Uh, I originally had Jordan Love because he was at the maybe 211 or 212, I think. Previously. I think he was in the third round when we first looked at it. it maybe. The and early, I had him jumping all the way up to like probably around where he was right now. I thought yeah. that was the right spot. What do you Agreed. guys think about? Trevor Lawrence sitting here at the 206. He had a little bit of a down year. I feel like the community as a whole is a little bit more negative on Trevor Lawrence right now. Do you think he's going to remain about that spot, or do you think there's a chance that some of these other guys behind him, that 301 we talked about being a quarterback, Kyler Murray, some of these other guys, do you think there's a chance that they kind of push Trevor Lawrence down that board a little bit? So, I mean, for all the yapping you've done, he he didn't, he <laughs> had, he didn't just have a, down, a little bit of a down year. Like, he definitely fell short of expectations this year. Right. Now – the interesting part to me, honestly, is that Trevor Lawrence is staying where he's at, and the community's so bullish on just the name cachet of Trevor Lawrence right. versus what his actual Shout out lost dynasty value is. Lost and found. Trevor Lawrence has not been <laughs> lost. Trevor Lawrence's found. skills and talents lost and found. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still trying to find it. But I mean, <laughs> I I don't th- I actually don't think so. Like the community's basically still saying that they believe that you know. Football Jesus is going to stay there. Somebody told T-Law's us this is the guy, and we believe he's going to stay the guy. Yes. T-Law is going to move. I think he's going to jump over both running backs. I just think running backs are so <laughs> devalued in Dynasty right now, and for good reason. Like, if you're in a full PPR league, which I think most, like, Dynasty leagues are, I'd rather – where you're starting three wide receivers, you got two flex spots, I'd rather go wide receiver heavy for sure and rest on the running backs. So let me ask you this. No. You say <laughs> – I'm going to ask you anyways. No it doesn't you. really matter. <laughs> no, you. Uh, so you say that the running back is going to be pushed down – I, it's a two-part question, really. Who is the first running back that you would even be considering in startups? And w- how far down the board do you think is the worthy of being the first running back off the board? Okay, so I think I think I would have that tier right there. Bijan, okay. 
probably Brees Hall as my two, Jameer Gibbs as my three, and C-Mac as my four, if I had to just go right off the rip right as now. all as a tier. Pretty much. I have, I have it very close to that. C-Mac might be a tier break right after those three, and then his own tier pretty much. Mm-hmm. I think T-Law, because people value quarterback so much, will jump Brees Hall, will jump C-Mac. Uh, the 203, 202, uh, where that's pick two of the rookie draft, probably will end. I think people will just value the youth of a, a Drake May over a Trevor Lawrence maybe. Uh, so I, I think T Law will probably jump those three, and then running backs probably in like the two five ish range. Because here's the other thing with like Garrett Wilson. Yeah, right? we hear two reports of Aaron Rodgers looking good. Wilson's back up to like the two hundred two, two hundred three, in my right. opinion. You know, he jumps well, the running backs. He jumps maybe T Law. I also think Amon Ra should probably be closer to that Jamar Chase tier. To be honest with you, in like the one nine, one ten range. Um, so running backs, I think ultimately will get pushed like the where Brees Hall pretty much is right now. But that might be the first running back off the board. So. What's hang I, I hang. hang I love that because <laughs> the the interesting part about this is I think receivers um, as a whole the quarterbacks scoring was down this year overall in yep. superflex well right. one quarterback too but because of that I think actually you're gonna you could see a potential for more receivers creeping up and I think especially with the draft possibly having Marv and Malik Neighbors possibly as top five picks yep. I I actually while I said that I think three hundred one will be up I think there's a realistic chance that the top five are all very close to the second round. Like, I could see Malik Neighbors being in the back half of the second, early third. I could see yep. all three of the quarterbacks being in round two, and Marvin Harrison's definitely going to be in I the also, first two. So, one of the other, like, interesting things that I think this board speaks to, but this was a strategy. So, I had a startup draft this previous summer. It was the only startup draft I did, right? And I went super quarterback and super running back heavy to start. So, I went with – um, it was like Bijan uh, – Deshaun Watson, Kyler Murray, Kirk Cousins, and Jonathan Taylor were, I think, my first five-ish picks. I ended up swapping Kyler for Lamar Jackson plus another thing, so that was that worked out nice. really well. The team ended up not doing well, but the wide receivers, uh, because all the quarterbacks went down, I had one QB to play for the most part. But because I went wide receiver late, what I did was I think the best value in dynasty startup drafts are the A.J. Brown types that you can get in round yes. five, six, seven. So my wide receiver core in that league, Brandon Ayuk, Michael Pittman, um, just DK Metcalf, dudes like that were mm-hmm. absolutely nailed. Obviously, the picks, you know, one of those could have easily been like Deontay Johnson and not work so well, but I nailed those. And then I got Jaden Reed and Tank Dell, drafted both those guys like later in the drafts. Those like 26 year old dudes, I'm talking about like Debo Samuel, mm-hmm. T. Higgins, uh, even like Stefan Diggs. He's older. I probably would stay off him. I like right now, those values are crazy to me that you can go quarterback heavy, but it speaks to like AJ Brown. AJ Brown falling to like the 207. He's 26. Yeah. He's not old, but the wide receiver landscape has shifted so much in the previous years that everyone who's good is like 22, 23, 24, that it makes AJ Brown look fucking ancient because it's not D-hop anymore. And it's I feel well, like there was a little bit of out of sight, out of mind with AJ at the end of the year. So yeah. like people kind of pushed him a little bit more down that draft board, even though from a points per game standpoint, like he was he's, one he's of 100 the and best. Uh, he, he's a hundred catch, 1500 yard guy every season. It doesn't matter how he gets there because yep. you can't predict 16 games. Well, I mean, and to that point, like AJ Brown is not as old, but he, he offers – I mean, he, he had a bad finish to the season, but, yeah. like, let's not act like the guy wasn't. He had six games over 125 yards. The guy's still a freaking I mean, yeah. Batman, you know? The, the Batman. overall, Yeah, the overall point I was saying is, like, A.J. Brown, I don't know if he's the guy I would invest in because he's surrounded by so much youth, but, like, those guys that you can get at discount right. in a dynasty startup, mm-hmm. I feel like are such right. good value. Well, and to that point, I was going to say, like, Tyree Kill is obviously different because he does not have as many years left in the tank. You would project because he's going to be 30 this year right but you could argue to get him in the third round for another year has the potential to beat every receiver again yeah so if you were to be in this early part and you have a chance to get a Jalen Hurts a Puka Nakua and then add a Tyree Kill on top like you're seeing in this startup that's that's crazy even then if you're taking a Tyree Kill in like the 303 like that's still a very early investment in your dynasty drafts do you feel like that changes the way that you have to build your roster? Because then at that point, are you kind of pushing your chips in a little bit earlier, trying to go for that chip in the first two years? Let me ask you this. All right, let's say th- that this kind of goes back to like the C-Mac discussion I was having right. earlier where like your first round pick might dictate the C-Mac pick. Let me ask you blindly. Let's say you had the 205. Mm-hmm. You took C-Mac. Okay. Tyree Kill was there at the 308. You took him. Mm-hmm. Having those two veterans, who out of anyone that's available – basically in that mid to end of the first round, who would you want with your first round pick, assuming you went C-Mac, Tyreek Hill? 
Like, obviously, you can't take Mahomes or Allen because they went off the board first. But in that, like, 108-ish range. I'd say I, first one's off the board for me is I'm looking at probably – I probably want to secure a quarterback. I like getting quarterbacks early, especially in these super flex leagues. So I'm looking at, like, the Burrow, the Justin Herberts. I know they're – a little bit older than the Anthony Richardson. There's probably a little bit less risk than the Anthony Richardson, but I just know I'm going to get good production out of them. And you pair them with a Tyree Kill or Christian McCaffrey, I feel like that's a f- you know first three picks that makes me feel like I can make a run at the championship year one. Would you go Herbert over Richardson because you're more confident that Herbert will produce, though, based on like having two vets now on the roster? Or does that not really matter to you right now? I don't think it really matters to me right now. I, I think for me it's just – minimizing the risk again I love Anthony Richardson in the small sample size that he showed us this year he showed us that he can be one of those top guys I mean from a points per game basis in those two games that he was playing the the two full games because he had like two half games that he played he was scoring just as many points as like CJ Stroud and and CJ Stroud's being drafted as the 105 so it is a possibility that he's up there but again very small sample size I know Justin Herbert I I know what I'm getting out of Justin Herbert at this point I I think a bullshit (laughs) <laughs> I think I think I think it's a lot of yapping. I think <laughs> I think that Herbert. I, I get it, but like Herbert actually, hit the weapons and the situation that they're going into is very um, not stable for me. I mean, th- there's a chance that both Allen and Mike Williams could be gone with the cap space. I'm worried about Herbert as, and, as and, a fucking and, player. And, and I think that the thing is, when I if you take Herbert that high, it's not that like I'm not going to act like Herbert's going to drastically fall down boards. But for me, I'd, I'd keep it just as it is. I would have C.D. Lamb, who was in the back half of the season arguably the biggest difference maker in fantasy. Keep him. I have a young stud scoring points. I have two older guys scoring points. And I'll try to find a way to get the Baker Mayfield types, the Kirk Cousin types later. And basically, if I don't hit this year, that's fine. And right. I'll, 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 I'll I, basically start rebuilding after that. I would – I agree with what you're saying. I also would say, too, keep in mind – Michael Pittman Jr., Anthony Richardson's wide receiver one, is a free agent this offseason. So, like, there is minimal risk. We think that he's going to end up coming back to Indianapolis. Yeah. But there's a chance he's not. And if, if that happens, then how do you feel about Anthony Richardson with no Michael Pittman That's Jr.? There? Okay. That's scary, yeah. Can I tell you, actually, though, yeah. I agree. I'd much rather him have Michael Pittman Jr. There's no yeah. – there's no argument. And the there. point is that there's, you know, no matter where you're going, there's going to be a little bit of risk, some variables that we can't predict right away. Agreed. Now, the one thing, though, with Herbert and A-Rich, right? So if you tell me that Herbert doesn't have his weapons, I'm more worried about Herbert than I am A-Rich, and that's because of the way that they play the game. And A-Rich is a guy that plays and the mobility he has. If you look at Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts, those are the two guys to me that, like, from a rushing floor standpoint, A. Rich is where not necessarily that he you don't want him to have weapons. He'll be yeah. better with Pittman, right? right? But if he's if he's down Pittman, I don't like it. But if Herbert doesn't have Keenan Allen and he doesn't have Mike Williams, realistically, dude, I think all these quarterbacks need their playmakers to succeed. Like right. you could bring that point up and be like, right. you know, if he doesn't have Pittman, I still feel good. Think about Josh Allen before Stephon Diggs right. showed up, right? Like he was pretty bad. Like look at any of the QBs here. They have really fucking good weapons for the most part, except for Allen and Mahomes over here. But besides him, like everyone has. And top tiers. Not to yes. not to beat it to death because we're not sitting here to to debate Justin Herbert versus Anthony Richardson. But keep in mind too, you saying the situation for Los Angeles, they have a top five pick in this draft. We were talking about right. Mike Neighbors, Marvin Harris, Fair. and some of these other Fair. guys. Like they could just add a guy like that they to could. their team. And then again, that situation. You know what they should have done? They could they could draft another Quentin Johnson. I was about to say they should have they, they should have not drafted. Quentin Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, yeah of things course. might be a little better out there now. Yeah. Just a touch. <laughs> but again, we're talking Hank. about in June, and if they if they take a Malik Neighbors. <laughs> I think people get pretty excited about Jim well, Harbaugh and Justin Herbert and Malik Neighbors in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, but it, every year everyone's getting excited about LA every, uh, fucking right. all the time, and they right. never do it. But because you do want me to beat it to death, um, <laughs> a Rich though, Pause. like with with Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts. What happened though when Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts did get that playmaker? So if if Anthony yeah. Richardson does keep Pittman, now all of a sudden the ceiling. As they, Jordan would say, the ceiling I mean, is the roof. You could tell they're – I mean, they're super committed. Like, the way that they, one, drafted him, maybe turned down a bunch of draft picks to not move back in order yeah. to secure him. Uh, they got Pittman. They re-signed Jonathan Taylor. They drafted Josh Downs. Who's to say that they don't attack the wide receiver group in the draft, right? And they, they don't go for, for a top-tier guy. Because there's a lot of dudes – I don't know what pick they have, but there's a lot of dudes – that are projected to go in the first round at the wide receiver position. Right. So say they take someone, a Brian Thomas out of LSU or whatever the case Boom. may be, yep. now we're talking about the complete opposite. And not even that, too. I've seen in, in recent mocks and stuff like that, too, like they could be adding a guy like Jatavian Sanders or something in the second round where they're adding some tight end. Right. Sure. You know, and, and, like, there's a lot of options that these teams can do. And I think that's what makes this whole 
exercise, the most interesting is because we're trying to predict or trying to predict what is going to happen after the rookie draft, after the NFL draft, all of these other things that we've done, and what does that startup ADP look like so, after that? So let me ask you guys this then. First thing I was going to say, in a tight end premium league, do you mm-hmm. think that Sam Laporta gets outside the second round? Do you think he falls into the third? <sighs> so, okay. Trying to separate what I think happens versus what I would do. There you go. Yeah. Let's talk uh, it out. Yap it. I ain't. Mm, that's fucking For me tough. personally, I think. I think that's probably the hardest thing to predict versus it's it's right on the cusp of being a second round pick. Yeah. yeah. I think the community is going to, is very hyped on Sam LaPorta. Rightfully so. He gave us like one of the best rookie tight ends. If not, it was the rookie it, or the best rookie he, tight end he, 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 ever, He right? basically broke, he broke most of Kyle Pitt's records. So, so yeah, I think there's a chance that. Come June, he's in the second round, especially in these tight end premium leagues. But for me, kind of going back on what you were saying, Nick, like I think there's so much value, especially look at that fourth round. You have Mark Andrews, Trey McBride, TJ Hawkinson. Like there's a lot of value down there. I would a thousand percent rather Trey McBride at wherever he's going, the 405. I think he'll jump up in tight end premiums, but I'd rather him at like the 312 than McBride. Um, Laporte at the two twelve. I mean, but but you also have Trey McBride ahead of Sam Laporte. I, I in yeah, rankings. straight up. Yeah, I have, I have McBride over Laporte. McBride. I okay. love McBride. Nice. I think he's a fucking playmaker. I mean, I even think you can he's get down. Like you can get down even further. Like it. It depends on how you want to play the position, but like even getting a Dalton Kincaid five oh six, like that's beautiful too. That's beautiful as well. Even a Kyle Pitts, if you believe in him, or the situation change. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff down here oh. that you could pick that value at tight yeah. end. And this is not a, uh, to the first two rounds, but I mean. Right now, when I look at boards, arguably the biggest surprise from last year to this year is how far, like, you would not have been able to predict that Travis Kelsey is almost a seventh-round pick right now. Right. Insane. I also, I, I, one of my strategies normally in Dynasty startups, I'm almost never going above and beyond for tight ends, but I stack them in the middle. Like, in that startup draft that I was just telling you guys about, the team I had, what I ended up doing was going, uh, like, I got to, like, the eighth or ninth round, and I went Njoku, Evan Ingram, and then Isaiah Likely, like, six or seven rounds later. And that group together, you know, collectively obviously got it done because Ingram was good for the first half and Joker great for the second half. Likely was good as well. I'm more of like a volume play when it comes to that because tight end premium, it's like you do need one starter, but you could also use flex guys if you hit, you know, right. in those spots because they're going to be better than running backs if you're in tier PPR. Let yeah. me ask you this because I'm looking at this board and, and a name is sticking out to me and it's a, I it's a three, name. I got three names. That, that everybody rip. loves. It's Pukunakua. Yep. So is there room for Pukunakua come June to – creep up this draft board or do you think he's kind of capped where he's at right absolutely. now absolutely and why and i would ask you why not i would say the narratives here are the narratives that i think the market are going to push against okay one i don't know if people i, I think we're all on board with like puka's good puka's above average <laughs> he's <right>? him <laughs> he, he may be him we don't know that because we look at the we look at like cooper cup before matt stafford came over mm-hmm. right good yep. but not not him Cooper yep. Cup became that dude once Stafford came over. I think everyone's going to be asking themselves, I'll put the tweet up on the screen asking, this was in early September, but I asked, like, how many wide receivers in the NFL right now would be doing what Puka was doing if they were in his spot? Now, I think Puka's overcome a lot of those. Like, he makes some crazy catches. He does a lot of crazy shit. That you're like, okay, he's, he's Clearly above. Clearly talented. Cl- super talented. But the narrative of, like, how much longer does Stafford have? You know, like, is Puka just a system guy right now? He's above average, but, like, there's a lot of dudes that you put him in a different system – Maybe he's maybe he's more Rashi Rice than fifteen hundred yards and a hundred catches, which is not bad. Obviously, he's a good player, but I think the narratives will start spinning around the Rams, around Stafford, around is he a system player? Oh, he is a fifth, sixth round pick. Like, will he eventually get exposed for not having that draft capital? Do I think they're right? No, nah, probably not. Would I use the two ten on him? Ah. And, and I get into the that disrespect. Same, I get yeah. into the same thing because we're looking at the wide receivers that are just above him, right? Like in that second round, you're looking at Amon Ross St. Well, Brown, AJ Brown, Garrett Wilson. How confidently are you taking Puka Nakua over an AJ well, Brown? Me, over let me, over let me just I, let I'm me not, let, yeah. let me just ask you though. Hold on, real quick. Let's just you were talking Say bullishly. It, you were talking <laughs> bullishly about Amon Ra. Yeah. Tell me what is different between Amon Ra and Puka other than Amon Ra's proved it longer and the same narratives that fit Amon Ra for two years while we slept on him. And now you're finally there. Puka did everything as a rookie you could possibly ask and had down weeks without Stafford there. I agree. And broke the rookie record. No, yeah. listen, it's, it's a fair, it's a super fair point. My thing just goes back to like, 
if Puka's not in this system, right? And you talk about even like St- Stafford making, making and breaking fucking like Calvin Johnson broke the record, Cooper Cup breaking records, Puka Nakua breaking records. It feels like a Stafford slinging the ball kind of thing, at least a little bit. And we know how quickly landscapes change in the NFL and surroundings and, ex- and, and I shit think like it's, that. It's a good problem too because look at how many elite wide receivers we have in these first two rounds. Like these are really good cornerstone. Like we're, we are so excited to build our rosters around these guys. Yes. The Justin Jefferson's Jamar Chase, the CD lambs, Amon Ross, like just to get Puka even higher. It feels like a stretch to me and I feel comfortable with where he's at right now, but I just, I don't know if I can get him higher. Well, and I'll just tell you two of the reasons why I'm bullish is they're basically tied together. One this year, you saw quarterback scoring was down as a whole. Defenses played more zone this year than they've really historically ever played. Guess who on all those boards, uh, the second round and first round picks, are the best against zone coverage? I'm going to Ross St. Brown and Puka Nakua. It's Puka, of course, yeah, because that's how the Rams offense runs. It's like Cooper Cup and Puka finding and, soft and spots in the zone. And that's where I was just going to say because I agree with your Stafford point, but I also think that McVay's a lot to do with it too. Sure. Yeah. So I think that, like, I think there's a chance that Puka still is undervalued, and the, the reality is – I don't know that he's going to go higher. So if we talk about projecting, like, there's a chance maybe he actually falls a little bit. I, I'm more bullish because I think – I would think say it's more likely that he falls than he rises. I agree. I, I do think, though, the only thing is it, it's really hard to, to knock. Like, Amon Ra, you could see it because there was, you know, this time for him, so going into his second year, there was – they brought in DJ Chark, all this stupid stuff now. But Puka, like, what can you argue uh, – the guy just broke the record as a rookie. Like, it's it's hard to argue some of that stuff when it's on the field. And then he does it in the playoff game and breaks yeah. DK Metcalf's record. No, like he's been balling. It's, it's super fair. I I, uh, I don't know. Like, for me, I'm looking at Amara, and to be honest, if someone took him as high as, like, the 105 or the 106, be a little, little bit of a reach, Dang. but I would really not – I have a problem with you, it. So, you, actually, I was going to ask you, you have him ahead of a uh, – you would take him ahead of Chase, you were saying, right? Or at least in that same range, correct? I would – In that tier. Yeah, right. he's 100% in that tier. So, then, would you take, like, would you take him ahead of CD, too? Or in the same tier as CD? Would have no problem with it. Okay. He's just been consistent. He's gone on that track of, like, if you look at his numbers, rookie year to sophomore year to junior year, it's – Perfect progression. Correct. With, yeah. that, with all environments and things changing around him, right. it's like catch number, boom, boom, boom. Yards number, boom, boom, boom. Touchdown numbers, boom, boom, boom. He's such a solidified part of that offense and such a good playmaker. He's going to get that fat contract soon. Like, he's he's dialed up for And as they's, they've added weapons, Laporta, Jameer Gibbs, and things like that. And he's like, still, he's still right. continuing. And I think, it, I think it's an up. I think his touchdown numbers increased because their offense yeah. got way, 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 way better. You can't dial in on Amon Ra anymore because you have more weapons. 100%. That's why, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Amon Ra. Uh, Puka, I don't see him being on a lot of my teams for, for better or worse just because that price feels hefty. It is. That's fair. I want to make one. I think we got to talk about Justin Fields for a sec. Okay. And then I want to make one hot take. That's a guy going outside the first three rounds that I, I think ain't. could sneak into that 2-3 turn over there. He's going outside the first three? Yep. He's Ooh. in the f- – yeah, uh, we'll get there in Let's a little hear. bit. Okay, so Justin Fields, he's at the 304. Okay. When Justin Fields plays, he's a phenomenal fantasy QB, right? No argument about that. What scenario does Justin Fields' value go down? Because if we're looking at it from a practical sense, right, the Bears end up going with Caleb Williams. That means Field, they're, they're not keeping Fields as a backup. He's getting traded elsewhere, and, that, and thus he's a starting QB. They can keep him and, you know, give him a contract. Thus he's locked up as a future starting quarterback. I guess the – what scenarios do you see where Justin Fields would go down? Down the this offseason happens right. Okay. We we fast forward four months from now because we're predict, predicting June ish startup draft. Where what world are we living in where Justin Fields does not jump into like the two twelve two eleven range? So you're you're saying you is it pre- just a franchise tag? You, you think? project like, you predict him going up, and you're asking what is what is the scenario where he goes down? Correct. So Re- I mean, a realistic scenario. The scenario would have to be one: the Bears don't keep him, right? So they trade him, and then when he goes to that team, the weapons that he is throwing to or avoid again and okay. when the narrative kind of fits the bill of like but do you this think guy's not going to be a good passer do you he's think Fields' rush. value drops from I, I feel like it's not really about the weapons around him it's more so like the longevity it's like do, does he have a place in the league so I would agree with that I also think does he drop from the 304 is basically what you're saying in June in this scenario I think the reason that I would say it's it, it could happen is because I think a lot of those yellow spots which are pick values are going to possibly go higher okay i i that's think why i think that makes sense but i don't but i do agree with you though like even if fields goes to a situation which we don't love in fantasy i'm with you i think he's proven to be a pretty good nfl quarterback he may not be the 
uh, you know, elite guy we've all hoped for. But I still think he belongs I think, in this league. I think league. he can be. I think he just yeah. needs long term security and he'll jump up draft. Boards. I think. I, agree. I think at I'm times, just saying in that scenario where he falls down, I don't think. I think he'll still tread water pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I think at times in in fantasy football and NFL football, they usually are in line at times, but there's there's times where they don't. And sure. I think like this is one of those yep. where it may be. If he gets traded and he goes on to somewhere else and the Chicago Bears move on from Justin Fields, it feels like in terms of NFL teams, this is more so like this is your second chance. Yeah. And it's not you're trading for a franchise savior. But in fantasy football, it may be a good situation for him to score a lot of points. But for the NFL year. teams yeah. could be looking at this as like this is your second and last chance. I, I, I think especially like in dynasty, I think it's hard to do because people want to have that security feel. Like you talked about drafting Herbert. You want to be mm-hmm. secure at the quarterback position. Yeah. But I, I think sometimes it's we have to look at it in Dynasty and separate, like, NFL success as a quarterback and fantasy success and understand they can be separate, and that's okay. Why is Justin Fields very good in fantasy? But, but he was also awesome over the second half of this year. Correct. He was Look, a great quarterback. I, I, I'm not saying he can't be a good thrower or secure himself as a quarterback in the NFL, but we know a lot of his success comes from his legs, right? Sure. And right. He can have a year where they, he was not a good passer and ran for over a thousand yards and be a top five quarterback. Right. So, my point is, when you get outside of the range of those first two rounds, like, dude, Tua has all the weapons in the world. We know the upside is more on Fields than it is Tua. Like, he's he's at a point where he shouldn't be falling any further. Would you take Dak or Justin Fields? I think I'm taking Dak right now because of security. Yes, but also he just put together a top three finish, mm-hmm. and and there's really no situational changes that are going to be happening well, at least next year. I the reason I would take Dak is because what you just said, but also because the first eight weeks he actually sucked and still was a top three quarterback. The second right. half was ridiculous. So if they continue what they did down the stretch this year, next year for a full season, I mean it could be crazy. But yeah. uh, I think it's really close, honestly. Nick, I know you want to get to your hot take, but I, there is one more point that I want to talk like about. To well, yeah. I'm interested to hear what he has to say, mm-hmm. but I'm interested in Kyler Murray at that 212. I th- I could make an argument that in my own personal rankings, I have Kyler Murray over Trevor Lawrence, and Trevor Lawrence is going at the 206. Like, I think the fantasy football upside is higher for Kyler Murray, and they also have a top four pick here in the NFL draft. We talked about adding a Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harris, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Do you think – you know, in the situation that maybe they do fall into a Marvin Harrison Jr. in Arizona, is Kyler Murray going to go up that draft board more? What's What's his contract situation right now, Kyler? It's a lot of a lot paid, of money. <laughs> they paid his ass. He got yeah. the extension. He got that yeah. bag. Okay. A lot. Okay, so that that's like I guess my concern for Fields is like NFL teams can push teams a year and then a year, like franchise tag. It's almost like they're waiting for you to be bad yeah. so they can get rid of you when they keep franchise tagging you. The fact that he's got the extension already makes me feel a lot better about if, it. If well, they move on from Kyler Murray, they're going to be, like, deep in the hole. Like, it's gonna, they're going to have to, like, pay – I don't know the exact number, but it's, like, 50 or 60 million dead cap. Yeah, they're not going to move massive. on from him, I don't well, think, this and, year. Yeah. And the, the big polarizing reason why he's not going down, like – Everyone was saying his value was at- uh, attached to Cliff Kingsbury, but because they paid him, it, now it doesn't matter, right? right. The contract's there. So right. yeah. the reason w- – Justin Fields is almost actually similar to Jalen Hurts in a way. I know you may say, oh, that's crazy, Jalen Hurts so good, but if Justin Fields had a contract to say he's going to be a team's quarterback for the next three to five years, it's he goes just way security. up. But, yeah. but, yeah. That, but for di- in Dynasty, there's – People get crazy about security drafting yeah. a quarterback in the first two, three rounds. Well, I mean, Jalen Hurts, it wasn't that yeah, – right, you're saying it wasn't that long ago where, like, Jalen Hurts, everyone was like, does he even have a good arm? Is right. he a good quarterback, whatever? Exactly. And then, boom. And do you think yep. that's because here – when we're investing a top two-round pick in a dynasty startup, like, these are guys that you are hoping are going to be big centerpieces to your franchise team for next three to five years. Which Is that because you don't want to whiff on these picks that you're more inclined to lean on the security? Yeah. I was actually just going to say, like, me personally, I'm not as worried about it um, because I, when I go to draft, I personally don't, like, lock in. To these are my starters. I, I look at just value, and I could move any of them before yeah. the end of the season. But I think what I was going to actually ask is that, to that point, I think that was what I wanted to talk about with you guys for the first two is if we were to pre- predicting the startups, right, in these first two rounds, can you tell me which guys are you most worried about, like, really having a – Big time fall in value because it's almost every single year you see, you know, I mean Travis Kelsey was a top 
to three star to pick. He's in round seven. Like there, there's always guys that really fall down the boards. When you see the the first two rounds that we either predict or that you're up there now, like who who are you worried about that they could really bleed value at the end this time next year? To me, there's a few names that pop up, and I think we've kind of touched on them. Trevor Lawrence is a guy that he goes out and puts another season like he put out this year. I don't think we're taking him top two rounds anymore. Um, another guy that I think good sample size, great great year, it, but Jordan Love. It feels like there's a little bit of risk there. I was going to say, though, the all four quarterbacks from Herbert down to Jordan Love feel like things can move here. If A. Rich gets hurt again, people are going to be like, is he injury prone? Justin Herbert, the situation could change quickly. He puts up good stats sometimes, but like other times, I, I think what's going to happen with Herbert is like that NFL to fantasy dichotomy here, yeah. where I think the narrative around Herbert is starting to be like, can this dude actually get it done for an NFL team? Like, can he win kind of thing? And I think that's going to start seeping into fantasy minds a little bit. T-Law, like you said, coming off a bad year, puts another one together, and we got problems. Jordan Love, um, I really like him. I actually would have no problem taking him at the back of the second round yeah. if I'm doing a startup draft, but I can understand, you know, sample size, small. Yeah. It is what it is. And, and uh, there's one more, and this is going to probably ruffle feathers, but we're seeing C.J. Stroud here at QB4. I almost assume that come June and some of these other months later down the summer, like he's going to surpass Jalen Hurts, the narrative that we've had Jalen Hurts at the sure. back half of the season and things like that. Are we certain that Bravo. we should be taking C.J. Stroud with – the same names of Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Oh, okay. I thought you were about to say I was in the top two rounds. No. Are we certain that he <laughs> should be, like, with Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes? Let me ask you. Uh, are you a Kobe fan? I am a Kobe fan, yeah. Okay, yeah. Really? That's the yes. Answer to the question. Hang. Hang. <laughs> Hang. Lock it in. Quit yeah. the yapping. Easy, easy. I mean, what, what do you need to see out of a quarterback to say that he's not solidified in, like, that? Top six right there out of the rookie season. Look, I'm not saying that I I don't think – I wanted to ask the question because I'm sure that there's other people out there who do have the question of, like, he saw a significant rise. This is a guy who we didn't even think was a top two quarterback in the class coming in 2023. We had Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson above him. What was the reasoning why? That's a good – it's a good topic to talk about, actually. Why? Do you remember? It's basically because he threw to all these great receivers at Ohio State. Right. And there's like, oh, he's accurate, but he's not going to be throwing to anyone open. He literally resurrected any chance of any people's right. career in that Houston team. Right. They were none of those guys you even are looking at very high on this board. And if they are, if they rose up, it's because of CJ Stroud. As a as a quarterback passer, like yeah. the accuracy he has, he's in the range of Burrow, I think. Pretty solidified for me. Now okay. the only the only thing you could argue is basically that I, I we saw this year Patrick Mahomes have a down year for Mahomes. Yeah. And I think that like CJ Stroud, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow. They don't offer the rushing upside if they have a down passing year. But mm-hmm. you can't tell me that C.J. Stroud should be outside the top six or seven. I and don't I, think. I fully agree with you because I do have C.J. Stroud in the same tier as Joe Burrow. Mm-hmm. That's that's where I have him. I just you're saying, have, But you're saying I have don't have Allen, him ahead of those other three. Yeah, because I have I Allen you. and Mahomes is a higher tier than that Burrow tier. This is another one of those discussions more like higher level where I almost feel like it just doesn't matter. Like you get any of those <laughs> six QBs. You're not complaining. Right, like, the, you're like, oh, should I take Mahomes or Allen? It's like, it doesn't fucking matter. They're both going to be really good for you for a really yeah. long time. And I feel that way, like, C.J. Stroud is Joe Burrow, just a, a little bit younger, maybe a little bit more upside. Who knows? But, like, I don't know, a point and a half per game or something over the course of five years, not going to be the reason you likely win or lose. Like, those are both nice staples for your team regardless. Just take the guy you like. I, I actually think— <laughs> Take the guy you want to root for. Take yeah. the guy you'd rather less see on your opponent's team. Yeah. So That's why I like tears, because you can take the guy you like but still get similar production. I, I actually, from the standpoint of if we drafted them and say you're going to have them on your team in three years, I, I tend to agree. Like, they're going to probably all go up and down in certain waves, but value-wise, they're all going to probably stay in this mix. They're, all those guys are pretty solidified. Right. Yeah. The only difference will be if you pick uh, C.J. Stroud. Right now, you could say maybe he's trending so high. Like, I'm going to start up. I saw him go 102. Maybe now you can yeah. actually get – like, this is where you could take a C.J. Stroud and kind of tear down. Maybe you can get a guy like A. Rich or a Herbert and pick up a serious asset if you time it right. But yep. from a standpoint of you're going to hold these guys for three years, there probably isn't going to be a whole lot of difference in what their production is, yep. honestly. They're all, all right. all going to be elite players. I just wanted to ask the question. Yeah, no, I mean, it's fair. And we talk about C.J. Stroud propelling his weapons up. The first player that I noticed on the board, and, of course, this was with way less data, but Nico Collins is going in the middle of the fifth round. Yeah, I genuinely think fourth. 
he was going in the middle of the fifth round. Oh, God. By the time we got to the updated board. Tank Dell's in the fifth round. Right. And Tank Dell was like a eighth or ninth round pick. Yeah. Immediately. And those were the first two names I said, there ain't a fucking chance they're going that low. Nico's Mm -hmm. already moved up a full round since like an extra 80, 90 drafts were added to this. I genuinely think Nico Collins will be a turn two, 212, 301 pick by the time startup drafts happen in three or four months. And are you comfortable with that price? Yes. Yes. You would take him there? If I went, if I want CJ Stroud, I I don't know if that like the two. I feel just as comfortable, honestly, as weird as it sounds, probably with Nico Collins as I do like a Puka at the two eleven, two twelve. Interesting. Nico was so good this year. He CJ, was him and CJ Stroud. Yeah, they made fucking magic together. You're, if I went Stroud at the fucking one hundred four, and I can get Nico at the three hundred four, you're out. not on board with that price. I mean, but do you think that that happens? You have a very good point. Uh, do I have what happens specifically? You think Nico? How much further do you think Nico moves up? Because four hundred seven, so eight. I could see a round. I don't know if I can see him go. Here's to the where. Second. Here's where I guess it all really depends. Is like, I don't know how much higher he can get. Like, I could see him maybe jumping Smitty. Like, can we really see him jumping Ayuk? Like the guys ahead of him as a just receiver is where I would struggle with it. Now, I think with receivers all go earlier, he could definitely jump up pretty high. The only thing about Nico and the difference in, like, Puka and Nico for me, because I agree with a lot of the points you made, my only concern is C.J. Stroud, when Nico was out, elevated Tank Dell. Like, I could see there's a scenario where they get other people there that now all of a sudden Nico isn't just the only option. Dude, um, he, he elevated Noah Brown right. for, like, Noah two Brown weeks. had great weeks. C.J. Stroud, the GOAT, so why not attach good-ass weapons to him on your team? Yeah. I don't disagree with – I would like Nico Collins. I've actually – 1,308 in 15 games. Number seven in fantasy points per game, 17.4. All right, let's go take a look at Puka. Enough. <laughs> I'm not saying he's going to jump over Puka. I know you're not. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Formation adjusted yards per route run. Th- these fucking numbers are getting crazy. That's how you – Crazier by the year, yeah. Look at the efficiency. <laughs> L- look at the efficiency line. That was a case close right there. Yards per out run like number that. two. Formation adjusted yards per out run number two. Yards per target number three. And it's like he's not just a possession <laughs> outside guy like T. Higgins. Right. He is – like, TJ, how many times does C.J. Stroud dial up that fucking Yahtzee ball down the field for Nico? And the, it the turns big, out it works more often than not. And yeah. the big thing, too, like, from a – from a stylistic standpoint, the biggest thing was I was going to say with zone versus man is you look at Puka is a zone winner and look at Nico Collins when he's in man coverage and Nico uh, is open, mm-hmm. CJ's not missing him. He's literally I think number one in the whole NFL um, from from man coverage standpoint. I'm saying man, he's also six foot four. I mean that helps so, a lot in that man coverage. Beast. That's what I'm saying. Like he's he's a dude that like soon as round three <clears throat> starts, I'm cool having him. He's like. Okay. I don't know, how much older is he, he than Chris Olave? Probably not much. Uh, maybe a Nico's couple years. Year three, N- year three right Nico's now? twenty four. Nico? Nico's going into year four. Finished year three, going into year four. Correct. Yeah. yeah. N- Nico's twenty four right now. Still on a rookie so, contract, man. Well, but okay. Here, here's my question, actually, and and the reason why I struggle with it, and taking it where you were talking about, like in that third round range, you were talking about can Puka go up? I see a scenario where he could. I think I'm drafting Nico at ceiling if I draft him there. Is my only problem. Like, I don't think he actually can uh, go past Puka. Um, maybe he could go past Garrett Wilson if he doesn't have a good year this year. Outside of that, I don't think he can jump on these other guys. That's my only problem. I think that was the argument for Puka for us. Is we felt like that was ceiling. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I, I, I think it's just we differ on the ceiling, what the yeah, ceiling yeah. could be for each one. But that's going to happen in all of your drafts, right? Like, everybody's going to have their own different opinions, and that's where you kind of value hunt and you try and predict these trends like we're doing today so you can now, see where those values will how, be gained. But why do, you, why, why do you think that that, like, based on – this is his very first year with C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud mm-hmm. was a rookie. Yep. Why do you think that that's a ceiling? Why do you think they can't improve? Why do you think he can't improve? From, from a, like, points per game perspective? I think he could. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's he what could. we're talking about, fantasy. I mean, it's just – for okay, so – if you look at the people ahead of him, right, you have a combination of uh, God tier, right? So you have CD, Jamar, Justin Jefferson, points mm-hmm. per game and youth. Mm-hmm. Amon Ra is basically that same thing. He's just had to defy draft capital. AJ's close You basically enough. get to that AJ Brown range where it's like the, Nico has to at that age where he's already – it sounds crazy, but at his age, year four, year five, it's literally all about production. So if it's not elite production – He's not going to maintain that price. He could go up if it's production, but like, there's basically no room for errors. What I'm saying. And to say. I think another that's just how dynasty works. It's like, yeah. the the young guys will get afforded a couple years of not producing. He's outside of that range, realistically, where it's like, you he better be producing to, yeah. to stay there. That's what but I'm you look at the guys around him, like Ayuk, DJ Moore, Michael Pittman. He's got, I think, two years at least on all those guys. Like he's yeah. 24. The rest of them are 26, yep. bordering on 27. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he belongs there. I think I think more realistically, he probably belongs 
like between maybe Alave and Jalen Waddle, but I wouldn't be surprised if the narrative, because the narrative around CJ Stroud ain't getting worse. You know what I mean? No. It's only going to get hotter oh, and hotter throughout the offseason. Nico Collins is going to be attached. Yeah, to I think the devil's advocate that I would play is that the situation in Houston's they have a lot of cap space and things like that. Like, what if they add another wide receiver? Do you feel the same way about that's, Nico Collins if they add another guy? That's uh, the thing. That's the thing I, has, I, I say, too. Maybe. I, I don't, like... I don't think that it means that he's toast. What's the chance that they add another guy? Like, oh, small? So, you don't. You I, think I, small? I think it's high. I think it's high. Dude, they got other needs. Uh, they got other needs on that team besides uh, they, they got no. They got uh, Dalton Schultz, Inc., who's been fucking great for them. They have Tank Dell. They have Nico Collins, and then they have a smidge of like Noah Brown played great. They have John Mechie. They have Robert Woods. Their O line <laughs> has problems. They need to invest in that. They they might bring in like a third round guy. That's not going to affect Schultz Nico is Collins. a free agent right now, so they they, they just signed him last year. One year, one year deal. deal. So he's uh, he's. He'll could probably be. be they could I think he him. gets an extension. He'll probably get come back. They, I think they bring him back. But I, yeah, I do think that there's a chance. I mean, if you get a, if they get a chance to Here's go and get a T Higgins or something like, I don't know why they wouldn't. I just feel mm. like that really helps elevate that team. I, I think the the, re, the reason you'd argue that they, I I would say that they invest in receivers for him is you have a guy that's proven that type of a, uh, like elite ceiling. You want to surround him while he's on that cheap deal with as much playmakers as possible. Yeah, it's not an indictment on Nico. It's just that they want to probably juice up their receiving corps as much as possible. I, I I agree with that, but I'm saying like at what what point does like whatever they add? It's easy to be like they'll add T Higgins. Like sure, Every, all 31 other right. NFL teams want to add T Higgins. Of course, the likelihood that they're the ones that do it. Fair. I yeah. don't know. Fucking eight yeah. percent, something like that. Maybe at the highest. Are they going to use a first round pick on a wide receiver? No. I'd be shocked if they did. And then once we get to like the late parts of the second round those guys for me at least not as like a rookie probably the first couple years are not needle movers to nico collins the the one thing is they do have uh if you remember they they fleece my cleveland browns so they have the (laughs) browns first round pick and they have their got two this year yeah yeah they they have their second too so like there's a lot they have a lot of ability uh they don't have their first they end up moving they have one they move their first for will Will anderson Anderson trade yeah gotcha but they but they still have they still have uh the browns first round and their second round so there's a scenario where I think they use one of those picks on a receiver, and this receiver class is pretty good. So yeah, um, sure, yeah. I, well, because you're talking about Brian Thomas and like guys like that, like you, you might have a shot to go depending on draft day. I don't know if it's super likely, but you might have a chance to get like a Brian Thomas or a Troy Franklin or something like that in the second round. Yeah. Beca- because the the other thing too is then I, I I don't think there's any way with the rapport that you saw with Nico that they let him walk. But no. what no. what do, what do we know about a guy that's not drafted in round one? That's going into year four. It's time to get. It's time to either pay him or shit or get off the pot. Yeah, yep. They got. They got to get a contract. Yep. He produced to get paid. And I would be shocked so, if I mean, they like, let him walk. And Tank Dell's also T.J. Stroud's guy. You know what I'm saying? Like he he was like, you fucking draft this dude. They did worked out well. They're gonna listen to Stroud. So I think Nico's probably a part of that like Stroud package right now. So I get it. Like they add something to the mix. My point of view is like it's unrealistic that they add someone that. Is such a big impact to Nico Collins. No, that, that's that's definitely fair. I mean, Noah Brown's kind of a sick wide receiver three. Who? Noah Brown. Oh, he was really good. For <laughs> thank, yeah. thank you, Mike. I know you hear that out there somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, well, I guess there's one last name that I like to round this. Is this your out with? Is this your hot take? No, no, Nico, no. The hot take Nico was Nico. Was oh, okay. Right. But I want to do because there's one Come more on, polarizing man. player on the board for sure, and it's Devon H N at 406, insane efficiency, whatever. Everyone knows the, the story with Devon H N. Okay. My question is Raheem Mostert. Not part of the team next year. If that happens, how high does HN go? Mm. I mean, I think there's a a chance that the hype gets to where you're considering him in the same range as a Jameer Gibbs. I think really? that's really what could happen with – think of how much people love Devon HN this year. I just think that we could get that out of control as a community. So, well – I think there could be people that do. I think that the, the reason that it it's won't. Not I right. think his rookie year was too erratic right. for people to feel safe with it. Th- that's exactly what I was going to get to. So, like, if HN would have had essentially that huge upside and played the majority of the season, I think that's the case. But, like, his upside's still tremendous. And arguably, his, his upside's weakly higher than anyone out there. Keep but in mind. Th- 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 this is a guy that still is very small and that has, like, Took a lot of injuries this year. I agree. And that, 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 I think, is what's ultimately going to keep him outside of the Jameer Gibbs range. I was going to say, though, you could probably see him going very much in this, like, mid-third, like, right in there, above or at Taylor, uh, above ETN. Something. I was going to say, like, I think he'll probably settle in Waddle, ETN, to a I just think if, right when there. you look at the fantasy points per game this year, like, Devon Achan averaged more fantasy points per game than Gibbs, more fantasy points per game than Bijan. Like, I, I think – 
there's a lot of people who like A Chan enough that it could get pushed up to that point. When, I'm not yeah. saying that that's what I think should happen. I think it just I goes back to the safety happen. thing where like he, he he didn't put together a long enough string. But I do want to yeah. say like A Chan for those of y'all that like really weren't about him in college or didn't really like get into it, he was he was a really good workhorse running back for A and M. Right, he was yeah. never just a speedster. The last year, he had a game against LSU, I think, where he had fucking 38 touches or something like that. Like, insane type of shit. So, HN is a dude that can prosper as a full-time back. He's not just a speedster that hits 80-yard hits runs. And if you've seen any coach allow smaller running backs to have workhorse roles, like, we think of Mostert bigger than HN. Mostert, realistically, what, 205 pounds maybe? Something like that. He's yeah. he's Track, on a lighter side. Like, track star speed, too. Mc, yeah, McDaniel's going to let HN rip if he's healthy. That, yeah, that, exactly. That Shanahan, that Shanahan zone read system, right. it, it's... The other thing, too, is, like, with, with A-Chan, it's basically, can he stay healthy? If he does stay healthy, even if he doesn't get that lion's share backfield, like, let's say he's even at a 10 to 12 touch guy, there's, there's an opportunity for him to go crazy on that. But yep. if he ever does get a 15 touch type workload or higher, it could break fantasy type I agree. Thing. Yeah. But and he's got to stay healthy. That's, that's what work. I was going to say, too, is he doesn't need a lot of touches to do what he did for fantasy football. But, like, do you want to take a guy at the 211 that you're like, ah, I'm projecting him safely to get 10 to 12 touches? No. Probably not. Yeah, right. exactly. That's my thing on HN. He'll definitely rise, I think, depending on what happens with, you know, Raheem Mostert and Agreed. Jeff yeah. Wilson and all that kind of shit. But they're always a revolving door, and they yeah. – they obviously like HN a lot. Do you mind if we rip one more name? Sure. Kyron Williams. How do you feel about Kyron Williams? I know he's very polarizing in the community right now. Is there a chance that he rises up if they don't make any additions in the running back room this year? What? Why is he polarizing? Let me ask you guys. I think because a lot of people think they look at the draft capital, they th- say, you know, year one he didn't do anything, and then he came in year two and, and blew up. I think you look at the range of outcomes that he's put over the last two years and you say which one is real and which one is not real. Well, I well, would say – I, I think it's relatively evident that this year was real for Kyron Williams. And I say that and I say that because McVeigh, historically, when he finds a there guy that go. he likes, he rides him. That's exactly and we could say like, oh, they split carries with like yeah. Cam Akers, Malcolm Brown. He never liked a- he fucking hated Akers Hain. the whole time. Thank you. Hain. I need some hangs <laughs> in this bitch. Yeah. Drop, drop a comment down below. Hang if you're Hain. if you're with me Sean right now. Sean McVeigh, all you need to know is it's Todd Gurley. When he decides when he decides it's workhorse. This horse. is the workhorse. And when everyone else has no chance, Hank, it's so, over. So, it, with that being said, you guys feel that way. You think he can increase from that 402 where he's at right now. My my problem, though, is, like, I don't love drafting the kind of, like, how old is Kyron? He's 24. 23, 24. going to be 24? Yeah, okay. 24. Let me, let me check that out right, right quick. My, my, I, they I don't fact, like drafting. They fact-checking me out here. Yeah, I don't, I don't like drafting middle round the disrespect and dynasty. okay he's only 23 23 gonna be 24 Ooh, fact checking him man um 59194 i i could see him moving up a little bit i'm a little bit hesitant with dudes who are already into their rookie contract and it takes a little while to break out only because that rookie contract comes up quickly and then yeah. second year the dudes who get second contracts as running backs are like the those guys studs. so yeah. this this actually uh i don't want to go down a whole tangent but basically from a from a holistic standpoint when i draft running backs now I don't think we should be drafting with, like, at the running back position, oh, this, this is going to be my guy for three or four or five years. Like, oh. I think that's just not realistic for almost everybody. And I'm looking more so, like, if I can I project their workload confidently in next year? And if I get the following season, I think that's the cherry on top. I think right. Kyron Williams has a chance to at least do so two So that's seasons. like, is that worth a third or fourth round pick in a startup? Because I'm like, I'd rather have a Nico or something. But, well, but then you get so, into the whole like punting running back startup, you know, strategy and sure. things like it, that, which I tend to lean If you're in like tier PPR doing, where it's half PPR running back, full for wide receiver, 1.5 or tight end, then like punting running back, I feel like is ideal. It, it can be for sure. And I don't disagree. The only thing is like with Kyron, we saw this year, you give this guy the work, like, the, the reason the running back I still want to have, if I do take in this earlier range, it's a difference maker. Like, Kyron Williams, relative to the field, can yeah. absolutely go ham. So, let me rephrase the way I feel about Kyron. <laughs> if we're talking about, like, fourth round, I think is okay, and I might even shy away from that in Dynasty. Yeah. Redraft for next year, if you're picking him as the RB2 or 3 overall, no problem with it. I legitimately think he'll produce like that. And is you, it worth it in Dynasty? And, and go, go back to the ADP just so I can put no this you. point up. Because if that's the case, if you're telling me that we think in redraft, this is a guy that is, can be drafted as RB2 with RB1 overall upside, I get him at RB7, hang. Hang. Yeah. Let me take that to the bank after I get my uh, you know, CD Lamb, I get my Puka Nakua, and I get my Tyreek Hill. 
Let me go ahead and get. Uh, I just let me go ahead and get that Kyron. I load, just, up, load up on points per game. I look at it and I'm like, I would just. Why would I spend that fourth round pick on Kyron when I can get a Rashad White in the sixth, or I can go get you know, even a deeper value? Maybe not as. I mean, we're not even projecting a long shelf life, but you can go get like a Joe Mixon in the ninth round and things like if that. If you're asking and me for would I rather have Kyron in the fourth or, or Rashad White in the sixth, I'd take Rashad White in the sixth. Yeah, that's I just where I don't I'm disagree. At. So I, yeah. I just don't. I can't. But I, I mean, don't spend it, that cost on the running back there. That's fair. I, I don't disagree necessarily with the strategy of like waiting on running back. Yeah. But if you're going to tell me that I my first running back comes in the fourth round and he has the upside of RB one overall for the season, I don't. I don't think it's like early, yeah. right? I'd rather yeah. take that almost than getting Bijan at 202 and projecting that he's going to be the guy Chill, for, for three years. Shawty. Chill. Hank. You don't think Hank. Raheem Morris about to turn Bijan into a Hall of Famer? Maybe. Hall of Famer? You better hope Hank. so. He look, he's should got already look. be are, in are the, the Fal- DNA. Are the Falcons bike? They've never left. Okay. Super Bowl fit, Super Bowl 61 runs through Atlanta. Everyone knew that. Arthur Smith was the GOAT. What's the next Super Bowl? What number? 58, 59? VXL, the one YY. That, the, one, the next Super Bowl Atlanta's in? Long Enough. time. <laughs> that ain't what I was <laughs> fucking at. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap up right there. Thank you guys for hanging out for this full episode. If you made it this far, make sure you go hit the button that looks like this. And while you're down there, you will have the link to the Dynasty channel if you're watching on the Redraft channel. If you're new to the Dynasty channel, make sure you subscribe. Yep. Make sure you subscribe to these two strapping young fellows' channels as well. We'll be bike with group podcasts like this twice a week, and then each of us will be doing our own individual videos once a week as well. So you're going to get five videos per week right off the bat. <laughs> Hopefully that is the ideal upside right now. Uh, pending me finding a thumbnail guy that I am comfortable with. <laughs> Might have to drop down to four if we can't figure it out, but you'll be getting a shitload of content from yep. us. Anyways, let us know what type of content you want to see us discuss. What we want to do as a group is really have more conversational type pieces rather than like, hey, these are my top 10 rankings, or hey, these are uh, the five must-draft players. We want to have more bigger picture, larger discussions that we can kind of just fucking yap back and forth at each other for. So if you have any good ideas for that, could be anything. could be league etiquette. It could be like commissioner tips. It could be there. there is no creativity boundary here. We are looking to take over the dynasty game, and this is where it fucking starts. Hank. 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 <laughs>